Let's look at an absolutely iconic Indian type of dagger and also consider how it marked out particular identity and even ethnicity. Hi folks, Matt Eason here of Scholar Gladiator. Now you will instantly recognize the famous Indian Qatar. It's a type of punch dagger and it just so happens that I have a variety here at the moment uh, which gives me a good opportunity to go through some different types but also to consider briefly how this Qatar really marked out the owner, the user, as Indian, specifically ethnically Indian as opposed to the types of knives and daggers used by neighbouring cultures. So first up, if you're not familiar with these, these are a characteristic type of Indian dagger. Now in India there were certain weapons which absolutely were used the length and breadth of India and were extremely popular, but they came in different varieties. We'll come back to that in a second. But just to say the Qatar, the punch dagger, is absolutely characteristic of India. And of course the characteristic sword that most people know from India is the Tolwa or Talwa. Um, but there are other Indian swords as well like the Kanda, the Pata, the Patissa, various types of Indian sword. But probably the Tolwa is the most ubiquitous and probably most famous and also the most um, encountered in antique collecting today. And also accompanying the sword of various types was the Dal, uh, which is the shield, almost always with four bosses, sometimes six bosses, and centre gripped at the back. And this was an import essentially from Persia. Now it's interesting because also from Persia, uh, came due to Persian invasions via Afghanistan, came the curved blade. So actually a lot of people think that curved blades are something that was found all over Asia and the Middle East. But in fact, they weren't. Uh, during the time of the Crusades, for example, in North Africa, the Middle East, most people were actually using straight blades. Um, so there's a whole other video there about how curved blades kind of spread around the world. And I have touched on this in previous videos. But these essentially, these curved blades came into India in the 16th century due to waves of Islamic invasions, basically. So people bringing these and then they were adopted and fitted to Indian hilts, characteristically Indian style hilts. But prior to that, Indian swords tended to be straight or forwards curved, not backwards curved. But we're not here to talk about curved swords or in fact any other type of sword. We're here to talk about daggers, specifically the Qatar punch dagger. So the characteristic features of it, simplistically speaking, are a blade, two um, bars that go along the arm and some type of cross piece. It's sometimes two bars, sometimes one bar various arrangements um, that you grip here. So essentially it is at 90 degrees to what most people consider uh, a knife being point up or point down. These are point forwards. So these are punch daggers. Now they're not the only culture in the world to develop the punch dagger. We do find them in certain other parts of Asia, Africa, and indeed Europe as well. But this particular arrangement with these bars in this almost uh, sort of capital H or I shape are very, very characteristically Indian. And moreover, these were carried for a few hundred years and several hundred years, in fact, in India, all over India. These actually had been around for longer than the uh, Tolwa. And these were often the backup. So I've spoken in the past about how in medieval Europe, uh, the knight had a sword and a dagger. It's exactly the same in India. Um, if we look at Mughal paintings of the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, for example, you usually see them wearing a sword and a dagger. And the daggers are usually one of usually three types. It's either a katar, a kanjar, um, which is like a jambia or a chilinum. Okay, the, there are other types of daggers as well, but it's usually one of those. But the katar was one of the absolute most popular. Now, what's interesting is India is a huge continent with a huge number of people. And back then it was also very, very highly populated and obviously it's always been the same size. Um, so a huge number of people and a lot of different cultures. Obviously there were people like the Marathas and the Rajputs and the Sikhs and very loads and loads of cultures in India. And some of them were friends, some of them were enemies, and some of them had different religions. Obviously there's, um, there's Sikhism, there's um, Hinduism, there's Buddhism, there's Islam, there's a whole load of, and some of those got on, some of them didn't. Many different empires at various points in India were at war with each other um, and were more uh, imperialistic than others. And this is before the Europeans turned up initially the Dutch and the Portuguese and later on obviously the British and the French. But, so you've got these empires 
and they distinguished themselves in a number of ways in terms of how they dressed, not just the religions that they practiced, the lang language or dialects that they spoke, but also some of them look quite different as well. You've got some varying ethnicities within India at that time and the way they dress as well. So different headwear, different clothes, different types of armor and different Qatar. Now, believe it or not, I think we have a tendency in the modern collecting world to look at these Qatars and think of them as just one type of weapon, but actually there's various types. Now, I have uh, four Qatar here, which I'm just going to very quickly show. We might do a deeper dive on specific types of Qatar in the future, but this one you can see has a broad triangular blade, a reinforced point, and is gilded. It's got gilt um, koftgari, it's called decoration on here. If I put that one down for a second, um, this one that I was holding at the beginning, you'll notice this is called a hooded kata. It's actually got a similar shaped blade to the other. It's got a very thick reinforced point, which incidentally is to help punching into armor, particularly male, chain mail. And this type has a big guard on the back, which obviously if you're going up against people with cutting weapons like swords, it offers you a lot more protection. And theoretically, I know people will ask, yes, absolutely, they could be used as an offhand weapon. And in that case, if you were using it partly as a parrying device, having that big, uh, cobra-like head guard at the back there is much better for protecting the back of your hand and catching things with while you're using the sword in the other hand. Uh, so we've got the hooded Qatar there. I'll put that one down. Now we go to an older type here. This is a Tanjore type. And you'll notice it has very different, the struts or bars that come up the side of the arm are a different shape. And they're actually got this very complex piercing decoration. This is probably a 17th century. This is actually older. It might be a later blade, but the hilt is probably older. And you'll notice, I've talked about this before, it's attached via rivets. It's not made in one piece. And the blade is triangular, a bit like either a socket bayonet or indeed a small sword, a European small sword. You could suggest this is an imported blade. In fact, looking at the workmanship, I think it's probably Indian made, but it might be inspired or based on European blades difficult to say. But anyway, that, as you can see, is a distinctively different shape. It's got a narrower blade. It's actually a very long blade and it's triangular cross section and doesn't really have a reinforced tip uh, and very different bars, very different bar arrangement. Although fundamentally, it's still the capital I shape. It, it looks very different. It's a different shape. So this is going back to the more conventional capital I shape, simple, very simple bars. This actually has remains of silver plating on it. So it was originally this whole hilt, not the blade probably, but the whole hilt was silver plated. The silver plating has come off because you get oxidization on the steel underneath, which makes the uh, silver layer uh, pop off essentially. But there is still some of it on the inside of the bars here. This is a really nice big one, but the crazy thing about this is it's, it looks like a smaller or narrower blade here. Very, very deep fullering uh, in the blade there. But if I just turn that sideways on, that is crazy, crazy thick. That is a, a, literally square. So if I hacksawed or uh, used an angle grinder to cut through the blade here and looked at the end, it's exactly a square about there. Really, really thick armor piercing point. So while all of these have armor piercing potential, it really seems that they've maximized it with this. And the point and blade profile of this is really like you find on some European rondel daggers of the 15th and 16th centuries. Really, really, really uh, catered towards armor piercing. And when we talk about armor in an Indian context, primarily male, aka chain mail, but additionally, and they did have some plate, but you're not gonna pierce through that. You're gonna pierce between the gaps, and in the gaps is male, or sometimes padded or linen layers. So very similar to medieval Europe, in fact. So really a big old armor piercing one. Now, without going more into more detail on Qatars, because I'm sure I'll do more Qatar videos in the future and where those different types come from and how you can locate the different types, the point I really wanted to make in this video was that there are different styles of Qatar. So if we take uh, two of these here, uh, which could be contemporary, more or less, within 100 years of each other, you'll see that they are similar but different. You'll notice that this one has a V shape here. Some of them are very rounded. This has a softer V shape here, um, and these could potentially be from the same area, but they have differences. They're different types of blade, got different characteristics. If I switch to the Tanjore one here, you can see huge differences between these two, completely different types of blades, very different types of bars. So what's interesting about these is 
Much like uh, tulwars and other types of sword, with these cutter, although they're all fundamentally the same type of weapon, you can actually locate where in India they come from, which culture they're associated with. Some Qatars, we can say, are probably from northern India and probably, you know, Sikh, for example, and some are definitely from southern India. So, um, absolutely, they wanted to put their mark and their style and their fashion and their regional and sort of ethnographic um, identity on these weapons. But what's interesting even more is, while they have differences within India, so a Qatar from, um, uh, from Madras will look very different to a Qatar from up in the Punjab, on one hand, on the other hand, Qatars are distinctively Indian. Now, we sometimes talk about Indian nationality, and it's a little bit difficult because it's a bit like talking about Italian nationality or German nationality when we're talking about centuries ago. Because, of course, there wasn't a unified country of India five, six, seven hundred years ago in the same way that there is now. The unification of India is really a post-British colonial thing. However, there was a sense of Indian identity. I'll come back to that in a second. So the reason I make the Italian and German comparison is if we look at medieval text, you can see the Italians refer to the German-speaking people as uh, Tedeschi or Tedesco, and they, they are recognised as different to the Italians. Okay, So the Italians, if you look in Fiore's treaties, for example, he recognises himself as an Italian and Germans as a foreign people. Tedeschi actually comes from the word for foreigner in the same way that Welsh is actually the old Anglo-Saxon word for foreigner in, in Old English. So there is a sense of us and them. And what's really, really interesting is that in India, although you have cultural versions of the Qatar throughout India, so a Sikh Qatar might look very different to a southern Indian Islamic Qatar, on, on one hand. On the other hand, they're still all using Qatar. And what's interesting is people outside India were not using Qatar. And I've grabbed two examples. So hopefully your geography is reasonably good and you know roughly where India is. Now, just above um, India, you've got two lands which are now separate countries, but in under British colonial rule were at various points considered sort of borderlands or parts of the Indian Empire. One of those is Nepal. So Nepal is very much a distinct country now, but under the British, it was partially considered sort of part of India almost. Um, and certainly there's lots of Nepalese um, living in India as well and serving in the Indian army even today. And you will all hopefully know that the Nepalese are famous for the cookery. Now, what's really interesting is obviously this is the national knife of Nepal and of the Gurkhas. And it's completely different to what I would describe as the national knife of India. Completely, like it's almost a completely opposite ethos to what you're going to have as your national dagger. That is a piercing, punching dagger with an armoured uh, armor piercing point and that is a great big chopping cleaving thing now it's obvious why they chose different weapons because they were wearing different equipment using different armor fighting in different ways different cultures and so on and so forth but remember that they have a massive great border with each other and of course Nepalese served in India uh, Indians served in Nepal and they fought against each other and they were allied against each other at different times and, um, certainly the Sikhs and the Nepalese fought side by side under um, British rule so completely different um, and very, very specific to the Nepalese identity and the Indian identity, even though, as I've said, within India, there was a lot of variation. Now, if we go to sometimes these people were enemies of the Nepalese, sometimes they were enemies of the um, Indians, sometimes they were enemies of the British and various other and the Persians and various other people. The Afghans, Afghanistan. Now within Afghanistan, you've got different groups of people, again, different tribal groupings. However, amazingly, despite the fact that you have these sometimes warring groups within Afghanistan with their own languages and everything else, they nevertheless did have a unified kingdom. They did have a king of Afghanistan and also they shared similar weapon types and their weapons were tied to their identity. And here we have a typical uh, short version. So there's the long chara, the so-called kyber knife, which I'm not going to show in this video because um, I can't show you everything in one video, but that is a pesh cabs. Now this is a type of dagger which has its um, origin of its evolution 
its um, yes, its basis in Persia, but it's a very distinctively Afghan dagger. And amazingly, this is also an armor-piercing dagger. So it has a T-section blade that's related to the development of things like uh, yatagans, but is also very much related to the longer and bigger chara or kyber knife, which is a usually a bigger version for chopping. And this is the stabbing version. So just over the northwest frontier border of India, and of course there was a warring region uh, before Pakistan was obviously a separate country, when the British ruled India, the northwest frontier was essentially the frontier warring borderland with Afghanistan. And at various points, Afghanistan was either an ally or an enemy. But the people there, the Pashtuns, for example, and the Afridi carried these carried these peshkabs, which again is a totally and utterly different weapon to the kata or indeed the kukri. So I could go on and on with these examples and if we look at other uh, nations on the border of India, uh, like Burma for example, the Burmese again have da. <laughs> and I'll just grab it, here we go, here's a Burmese da I just happen to have lying around. So again, completely different weapons. So to conclude, the kata Amazing punch daggers, you should learn more about them and we'll do more videos about them in the future. There's a lot of interesting features and differences between them. But the interesting thing is, number one, there are a lot of different types of, let's just grab one that's very different. There's a lot of different types of Indian kata. And by looking at the different features and design, design elements, you can date them, but also place them in India and assign them to, when we're lucky anyway, assign them to specific cultural or religious or whatever empire groups. So we can look at one and say that's probably Sikh or look at another and say that's probably Maratha and so on and so forth. So there was a degree of identity and difference, differentness um, and distinctiveness within India. But secondly, and the second point is, India as a whole still saw the Qatar basically is its national knife. Okay, there were a couple of others as well, like the Kanjar, but this was found all over India and not outside India. So it's a, this amazing paradox. On one side, a lot of division and difference, differentness within India, but also the unity of recognizing these people are all Indian people, despite their differences. And we are different to Afghans. We're different to Nepalese. We are different to Burmese. I think that's anthropologically fascinating. Hopefully you find it fascinating as well. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video and I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.